years ago, about three or four years ago, as I started to develop the Digital Literacy Lab at CAS, and I began to look at uh, digital storytelling, and I began to do my reading, what I realized is that as you look at the literature in digital storytelling, all paths lead to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the work that he's been doing for decades has really permeated a lot of what's going on with digital storytelling in uh, higher education, as well as other areas. But he really, the, the models that, that Joe has developed really do influence almost all of the different models of virtual, of uh, digital storytelling that you'll find going on in, in university contexts. So I went along a few years ago to attend one of their workshops at the Story Center, and I had a very professional story in my head. And I got there and I started to go through my first story circle and I realized, holy cow, this is not my story. And I switched my story to something really quite personal. And I walked away from that storytelling event, just feeling like you know something special happened here. And that was three years ago. And, and during the time between then and now, we've been working to try to figure out how can this fit in our work here in Hong Kong. And, and so I was quite fortunate when you know, we began to develop some ideas. And then about six or eight months ago, we thought, hey, let's, you know, let's apply for this grant and we'll bring Joe out here with the, our friends from the consulate. And uh, I, I pitched the idea to the US consulate, Hong Kong and Macau, and they were very enthusiastic about bringing Joe out to help work with teachers here in Hong Kong. And so we put the plan together, we bought the tickets, and then coronavirus came along and, and things sort of fell apart with that. But we, we went back and we were able to retool the original proposal. Over the past two weeks, really, Joe has been doing a sort of online artist in residence uh, here in, in, in Hong Kong. Last week, we had colleagues from Hong Kong UST, Holly Yu, as well as Hong Kong U, who attended a workshop with Joe throughout the entire week. Um, and we heard really, really great things about that. Um, I see a lot of potential for the work that Joe is doing here. And so I'm really, really feeling very fortunate and uh, glad that we do get to chat with Joe today. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about Joe's work. I'm going to let him do the talking. Um, he's really, really good at talking. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'll just turn it over to Joe and, and just say, Joe, thank you so much for being here today. And also, Lillian, thank you and the Hong Kong CPD Hub for organizing all this and making, happen, making it happen. And of course, thank you to the U.S. Consulate, Hong Kong and Macau, for sponsoring this event and, and all of the other events that happened this week. We've been really, really grateful to all of you. Yes. Joe? Joe. Thank you. I will take it away. You know, uh, ditto to all of the thanks. Uh, you know, particularly the U U.S. Consulate, the, we, our organization has been very fortunate to work um, in countries around the world supported by the State Department. Um, in all sorts of interesting areas that, that I think represent some of the best of our work, you know, working around issues of gender-based violence, working around issues of uh, corruption and, you know, kind of uh, the expansion of democracy and, and working, you know, with people around uh, the kinds of needs that, that can be captured through a story, you know, meaning the experiences of people who might be a, a degree marginalized in their society outside of it. This, this talk is like, it, it, we're calling it <laughs> digital storytelling history, practice, values, and principles. It really is like the evolution of a form of, in a practice. And, and it is true that because I've been around this for 25 years, um, I have a perspective about, you know, what this thing we've done. And, and of course, we've kind of helped shape the, the perspective. But it sort of from the, the viewpoint I have is that everybody that comes to this particular media, participatory media practice, is a founder of their own approach. And Patrick, you know, uh, struck me immediately as somebody who was looking at the way that Hong Kong U could use this as a form of experiential learning, as a way to connect with the students that are, you know, doing things like you know, study or service abroad. 
And, um, and I'm excited about what the potential is because the workshops we've been having, uh, both with the, the faculty level people from the three institutions and with students this week gives us a lot of hope. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm a storyteller, right? Uh, that's what I come from. Uh, my history, you, you know, coming out of uh, the University of California, Berkeley in the early 80s uh, was as a theater professional. I ran a, a theater organization in San Francisco. It was known for innovative theater, but it was also known for, you know, what we would have called art for social change which meant we were, you know, working at the nexus of the, the social issues facing minorities, facing women, facing um, gay, lesbian, transgender people in our San Francisco community. It was a very natural part of what a theater might do. But we were also very close to the world of technology because we lived down the street from these new companies that were emerging in the 80s with the personal computer and with these new media softwares that were, you know, uh, going to kind of change the face of the way we relate to the world, including the, the evolution of the World Wide Web, as we called it in the, the 80s. I met a guy who was kind of part technologist, part performer. Really, his formal profession was um, video production. He worked as a commercial video producer. What he got paid for was generally something called video postcards. There were these very short pieces that would be bought by both national and international uh, media organizations to sort of represent things. And, and what he liked to collect was Americana, was odd stories from the side of the road as he drove around the United States working for Showtime or HBO. Or he would collect this funny stuff. And he had a stage show that you see in the middle here called Next Exit, which was touring. I mean, my theater kind of essentially assisted him in producing it uh, as part of our solo performance festival. And then he started touring the, the technology industry conferences and, and trade shows in the early 90s. And it became kind of the basis of an idea. And at the same time, we were creating um, a, a kind of uh, shared discussion amongst all these new media developers uh, that we in the, in the early 90s had. I had something called Joe's Digital Diner, which you see the three of us there in our earlier incarnations being funny. Um, but that was sort of what went on is the arts community, in my case, the performing arts community, smashed into um, the new media explosion that happened in the early 90s. And digital storytelling was fortunate to kind of emerge from the very creation of things like video on computers. It didn't exist before that. You see kind of where we went, you know, we started in 93 in San Francisco. We were at UC Berkeley School of Education for three years. And, and then we moved over to all these other areas, uh, becoming a national, international organization. It's taken us now to 71 countries. Our work's been translated 17 languages, blah, blah, blah. And, and that what Story Center is, it's a staff of about 10, but about 40 global contractors. We operate in five US cities, but we also in an office in Toronto. But we kind of go wherever people ask us. So it's not that unusual for us to be here. So what I want to start with is showing what a digital story is. And arguably, this is the first. This is, this is the, the story that was the cornerstone of Dana Ashley's theater production. And it had to do with his grandfather, a well-known um, surgeon, I think, in, in Boston, like a patrician in Boston culture, um, owned a 16 millimeter projector in 1925. So there weren't a lot of people with <laughs> 16 millimeter home project, I mean, not project, a 60 millimeter camera. So he had kind of what the pros did. And he, so he made the earliest home movie, right? So this is a cute little film that sort of talks, I'm going to kind of situate our work as, as an impulse from the very beginning. Movies with an old Kodak 16 millimeter. To cut that off. My grandfather took home movies with an old Kodak 16 millimeter movie camera. They didn't have zoom lenses in those days, and he knew how to hold his shots. Each year, as his sons were growing up, there are my two uncles and my father behind them. Each year, he would march them out of the house, line them up in front of the camera and say, turn, now. And they would turn and turn. And then they would try to figure out which way they were supposed to turn. 
I love watching their relative heights change. One year, my mother appeared in the lineup. As they turned, they kissed and laughed. They were divorced when I was young, and I never remember them showing much affection. So this is a magic moment for me. The next year, 1941, a new generation. That's me and a cheap camera trick. I never get tired of looking at these images. These men and women now in their 80s looking so young and vital, the colors so rich and the breeze still blowing through the trees of this land of ours. I think to myself now, where has time gone? My father and I would often look at these movies together and he would say to me with obvious affection. You were so cute, Dad. And I was, I mean, look at me. We all were. But then I thought to myself, and now look at you. I suspect he must have had the same thought though he never would have uttered it. I mean, it must have completely dumbfounded him that his firstborn, his only son, Dana Winslow, actually the third, could possibly have ended up traveling around the country at age 30, calling himself the Colorado Spaceman. This is not what my father had in mind. Make sure this doesn't keep playing things, which it will probably would. Um, you know, I don't know what, what you would think of that. <laughs> One of the ways to see uh, culture in the history of electronic media is that for 80 years, um, the screen talked to us. <laughs> and for the last 20, we talked back. We, we basically had the dominance of electronic media, you know, film and television. Um, kind of shape our public self in some ways more than anything else and with the coming of of both the tools of being able to create media and share it you know now what we associate with social media um, it turned out we would be very happy to entertain ourselves with the stories that come out of our own lives in our original thinking you know this is to kind of bring it back to you quickly right as educators our immediate thinking back then was everybody probably would enjoy doing some reflective writing. It's like you could take a memoir class or you could make a home movie, right? The home movie would tell you something about, you know, who you were and maybe you work with generate cross generationally, a young person working with their grandfather to hear the story that they had to tell. And we kind of imagined that there was a business model just to do that. But, you know, quickly educators came dropping into our little arts studio in San Francisco where we were helping people make these little films. And they said, what a great way to get young people involved in thinking about their lives. And, and it didn't take long for it to be a question that was, you know, early on one of like the digital divide, getting people who, who weren't getting access to computers, who weren't affluent enough or privileged enough, to have their first experience and well, why don't they do this instead of learning, you know, accounting or something about how to do a spreadsheet. Why don't they learn how to do this as their way into computing. So that happened. But it's very quickly people began to think, you know, if you could use these kind of stories as part of the learning process. And again, this is a time where the not idea of portfolio in education, can we have students reflect on how they learn. What are the stories of how they learn? It, that, this was coming forward at the same time. And just the general sense that affective learning, where your emotions, your body, yourself, sits in the learning process matters. We were moving beyond the idea that, you know, students have to be conformed into the world of learning based on uh, our model of the factory of learning. And how can we make this more individualized? And of course, as all these people got access to these tools of, of creating their narrative into the world through, through the internet, then it was even more important that they had a mechanism to look at the way digital storytelling could become a kind of core process of inquiry and reflection in the educational process. Um, when we've presented the idea of digital storytelling, and you know, Jane is here, <laughs> Chrissy and others who were in our workshop last week, you know, most people would sort of say, well, it's a cool thing, 
it's, you know, I could see why it'd be individually useful, you know, meaning I, I might want to do this. Some of them might go, well, this would be a great project for certain kinds of categories of learning. You know, the humanities come to mind if you're talking about history or you're talking about literature, you're talking about, you could make multimodal, multimedia stories out of the content. But we are kind of like, having done this all these years, we're like, this isn't really what we're about. This isn't the story of our work. And, and in, in some ways, for educators, these issues of intimacy and safety, meaning how do you create a safe learning environment where people can be themselves as themselves and still succeed as learners? How do you do that? Well, you let their stories matter in the classroom. So you find a way in every classroom to make the story of the individual student matter somewhat. Again, it doesn't mean it's the point of the class, but there's a way that, you know, even with an introduction, you're kind of getting a story out of some, some uh, process. And because the way we always did this was a social mechanism, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, that we think that, that collaborative processes like this are a way to build a culture of learning inside the classroom. Meaning by doing these things together, as I think even the Hong Kong students this week who are working through Zoom, you know, they're sort of seeing each other as part of a kind of team of doing this. And that, as we said, this ability to sit back and think more deeply about why a story matters and why, a, you know, what they're doing matters to them in the bigger sense and the very small sense. Um, it becomes a critical literacy that they can use in other kinds of analytical processes that aren't necessarily narrative. They learn how to think about what's the layer underneath their understanding. And inevitably, you know, we talk about it in a um, public health sort of way about being stuck in a, a psychological moment of not being able to move forward. But creative breakthroughs can also be oh, this gives me a whole other way of expressing myself around things. And uh, so we've been writing about this for a while, situating, if you will, you know, uh, digital storytelling as the intersection of a bunch of processes, the engagement process like Patrick's doing with his students in Myanmar, the reflection process, I've been talking about that, but also the emphasis on design, experiential learning and media in which you see all these other kinds of participatory media practices relating to it. But we think digital storytelling centers a lot of these processes. And uh, somebody's going to say, can you give me the slide? Because every time I show them, <coughs> I will send Lillian these slides so she can share it with all of you. I, I love doing that. So. so what happened is digital storytelling became all these things. And I don't like reading lists and reading PowerPoint slides, but you get the idea. It's about creativity, personal voice, social change, service and engagement, media literature, et cetera. These things became the countless ways this became a tool. Uh, you know, what Ivan Illich, the educator, you know, kind of radical ed education uh, theorist from the UK called a convivial tool, a tool that assists us in moving through the world that digital storytelling became something that we imagined sort of in the pocket of every, every student, you know, and a lot of educators and the way that they would work through these kinds of issues. But what do we do? I'm, I'm going to switch gears in this evolution to say this all started with um, a three-day workshop model that was honed to a kind of machine in the mid 90s. And then by the time we were at Berkeley, we were teaching other people to use our workshop model. And the workshop model included us talking about story in a particular way. I'll talk about that in a second. Doing this very, you know, nuanced facilitation process, like this group of people in a science museum in New York, I remember this gig, where people sit in a circle and hear each other's story. Uh, we teach media production, but we teach it in a just in time, just enough information. We don't require expertise in the tool set before you attempt to make things. And then finally, in all of the work that we do, everybody succeeds, meaning the celebration at the end of the workshop where all the work is screened is sort of the focus of it. So we had to develop the kind of curriculum and principles that held, had everybody calibrate their expectations into uh, whatever time span they're given, 
and, and the trick of that is something that we've taught people is like, if you've got six hours to do this, you do this. If you have 20 hours, you do this. If you have four weeks, you do this. If you have a whole semester, you do this. And, and that kind of thinking, you know, has, has gotten us around. Back in 96, we put out um, the kind of principles of this is something called the cookbook. Apple Computer paid me to write a manual for our walk workshop. But over the time that cookbook became a textbook, which is now in its sixth edition there on the right. And at the core of that is this um, seven steps of, of the way you go through a workshop one, but also a kind of approach to the aesthetics of digital storytelling. I'm not gonna present that lecture right now. Happy to get the book to you guys. You can read about it and, um, and kind of learn it yourself. But the, 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 it was a different approach than, than I think a lot of people who are taught communication theory, where the emphasis is on audience. Who am I talking to and how am I supposed to talk to them? And what am I saying? To what's inside of you that needs to get out and how can you now frame what's inside of you for an audience that holds the emotional and, and sort of narrative awareness that's unique to you as an author? If you do that successfully through the multimedia of visual and auditory things, meaning using images or moving images and using music and soundtrack, you know, ambient sounds, um, you can create something very powerful in this short form. So you could see that that three-day curriculum suddenly became a 30-hour higher ed curriculum that could be very detailed, where the writing goes into you know one level after another. And we're about to begin a 10-week course that Story Center is leading that I'm sort of going back into this approach. They'll make, in fact, three stories during the course of our, our 10 weeks because people are just that much more able to do it. It used to be a long kind of technical curve up to get people to do this stuff. Now, of the, of the 20 students we had, Patrick and <laughs> Isan, you know, at least six of them had a story done in less than two hours. I'm convinced. They just went bam, and they were done. And now we're in the online environment. We're, we're adjusting this to, you know, multi-week, or in, the, in this case, we did a, an intensive five-day workshop with, with folks last week. And we're doing sort of a five-day workshop this week. We we're only using three sessions. But you know, all of that is just, I said, we then redraw the expectation. So last week it was a story with a script of 250 to 375 words that made a narration of about three minutes, which made a film of about three and a half to four minutes. And now we're sort of, this week we're saying a minute and a half, 150 words script, six pictures, keep it simple, you'll finish something. So we'll still be able to show 20 stories on Friday. Um, since many of you were like, well, okay, I've assigned a digital story. How the heck do I um, grade a digital story? How do I assess it? And assessments have been developed all over this work, uh, borrowing from the seven steps uh, in a way that gives you a sense of how you could turn these into things that are a little more understood. Is, you know, is your messaging and purpose clear? Is your sense of unique voice and connection to the material clear? is your ability to do a scene and, and, and kind of flesh out the structure of a story good? What are your visual choices? How did you deal with your performance of your voiceover and its integration with the audio? How did you deal with things like pacing and, and you know, the design elegance of a well-made film means it's, it's both expansive and reductive. You're trying to get it as tight as it can be, but no tighter. And, um, and then you, how does this fit? Once you've done it, how do you use this story? What creativity can you apply to the way that story will, will come into the world? So Aysan, I didn't tell you this, but I hope you're okay, I, I share your story. Um, I'm sharing this to, to show you how it sets up in a, in a workshop. And I hope somebody's looking at um, the chat. I'm not looking at the chat. <laughs> so if somebody's trying to get me and ask me questions, I hope Isan or Patrick or somebody are kind of covering that for me. But just to set this up, Isan did this story <clears throat> prior to our workshop last week, but I thought it was a good example. And I hadn't asked permission of any of the participants last week to share their stories. There were some beautiful stories that came out of last week. But Isons was a good prompt to sort of say, well, how would you initiate the use of digital storytelling in the culture of Hong Kong University? 
and so we went with the idea of, of a, a journey story. So I want to just share this as, as an example of what this could be like for the, your students coming to Hong Kong U. With luck, with luck, it will work. Oops. I'll keep it going. There we go. It was a cloudy day. I was standing on the side of muddy jungle road, shaded with large trees from either side. The truck that was carrying us was struggling to get out of a pool of mud it had slipped into. It was loaded with local goods, and it would go side to side each time the driver hit the gas, and every push only sank it back into the mud. There was this feeling in my chest that I couldn't really describe, but I keep looking back at the road where we came from, the way back home. And that was when I realized everything was going to be different. I was only 15 when I left home. It was discussed with my dad that I would go to Thailand and live with my brother. I had never been away from home before that. My dad wanted me to explore opportunities to study abroad, but I was more excited with the idea of leaving home. I remember the day. It was the second day of Burmese Lunar New Year, right after our biggest New Year celebration, Din Jen. I didn't know we would be leaving until a cousin of my mom came and told me that we were leaving right that instant. So I ran to the farm where my parents were. I shouted, "Mom, Pa, I'm going to Thailand." I pack a few pairs of clothing, a green blanket that my dad gave me, and some cash. I didn't even remember to give my parents hugs when I hopped on the back of the truck. I was grinning with excitement when my parents wore the look of worries. When we started to move out of town, I realized none of my friends knew I was leaving. I wondered if they would be mad at me for not saying goodbye. It took us two days to reach our destination. We stopped at a tiny village with no electricity for one night rest, and I was very grateful. I got the blanket that my dad gave me. I felt so alone. For the first time in my life, I wish I hadn't taken this journey. I wish I was at home, with my family, enjoying our dinner, warm and happy. But instead, I was in the middle of nowhere, with people I barely knew, to set off a journey of unknown. I cry myself to sleep that night. Under the green blanket. The next day, the truck stopped at a town in the middle of our journey, so we hired two motorbikes to take us to the border. We crossed the famous hills of Karen State. Every turn gave me chills, and made my palms sweat because we were so close to the cliff. But we made it, and crossed the border without any documents. We just bribed the border guards. And cross the river that divides Thailand and Myanmar. It has been ten years. I now live in Hong Kong, thousands of miles away from home. I went back to visit my family multiple times, but I had never been back for the New Year. So I hope for next year I'll be with my family for the New Year. Thank you, Isan, for letting us share that story. Um, you know, obviously, in the, in this environment, I, I, it's hard for me to know kind of how this is um, being read. You know, that the, the story you see, I mean, you could look at it from one standpoint. It's, it's a personal narrative about a journey and, and, and told in the kind of filmic way of a moment in time that was sort of decisive. Were you going to survive? or not, not survive, you know, was this going to be a more traumatic or less traumatic uh, narrative? 
because of the stakes of it, it was very powerful. So when we came into the workshop last week, we said, well, you know, find a moment from your past that might explain why you find yourself working in Hong Kong. And inevitably, there was a sort of curriculum vitae response. You know, well, I did this before I did this, and I did this. And then we worked with people over the, you know, first day and a half to sort of say, well, can we kind of emphasize something that has a particular narrative strength in that journey? And each of the students and participants kind of found a way to articulate it. In the end, though, it, it, you know, at least one of the participants was like, I think it was you, uh, Chrissy, it was like, well, this would be a great way for my students to meet me. It'd be a great way to connect and begin a discussion of like, well, how did you end up here? And, and maybe there's something you, you didn't know about me or you wouldn't have known about me in the normal course of stuff that actually deepens the connection between me as the authority in the room, you know, uh, helping guide you through this material and your own lived experience and how it relates to the way you understand uh, the intent of the content, you know, whether it's to just get you to a higher level of academic achievement or it's to actually integrate with, with things that you're passionate or concerned about. Knowing how your teachers got there is very important. We've done these kind of stories all over uh, the world. And, and as we did them, of course, I, I'm, I'm a trained in, in um, playwriting and in, in, in narrative of, of the long form of a play. But like most people who work in, in the humanities, we're always looking for the science behind our thinking, right? And it's sort of, uh, we're looking for uh, validation. There have been many roads I've had into that. I'm gonna share a couple as a slight detour in this idea of the values of our work. Uh, in the last two decades, a lot of people have been looking at the role of narrative in the human experience, not just, you know, the, the sort of why do we all watch stories and read novels and do all this at the kind of core of the humanities, but sort of what made us human in the way that we built um, connective understanding each, each other, built society through stories. And these three writers were a kind of group of writers and thinkers that began to ask this, not just about story, but about um, the, the representation uh, of ourselves in the world. Um, I'm obviously our, an art-centered learner. I believe the arts are critical to our success as being fully rounded, educated, critical thinkers in the world. But I think narrative has a particular role and I think many of us have lost the ability to tell stories. And so I began to think about of the thousands of people that I've helped with stories, what's going on when they're in the room with me? And I began to think about uh, developmental psychology, frankly, is like, what, what is it in our lives that gets us stuck? What are the kinds of plateaus that we come to in dealing with the issues of our development through life, from being an adolescent to being a young adult to being employed and married and parents and then dealing with elder parents and dealing with our own you know career path and authorities and the depth of our relationships what are all those things and how does that come out with any story that you're telling and I began to understand that there is something going on there that had to do with the way stories kind of operate underneath us and I ran into you know there's always a Harvard guy somewhere right there I ran into this Harvard um, professor of psychology, Robert Keegan, who wrote this book in 1983. And again, I'm, it's not my background, my background in, pol in political science and theater, right? So I'm sort of that guy. But when I read this, I, I, I had been reading Eric Erickson's work in developmental psychology and its relationship to, to the, the thoughts of our work with young people and older people in different cultures. Erickson did a lot of work, kind of an intercultural understanding of development. I read this book and I thought, well, this is kind of where, the way I look at it. I look at most of us as being inside a sort of psychic tornado where we're kind of modulating between self-understanding and how we relate to others in the world. And that modulation, this guy David Bacon that, that informed uh, Robert Keegan's writing, he, he saw us kind of as we go through the stages of our life, kind of trying to figure out how to be 
in the right way, how to be, you know, part of the world, but also have increased understanding of what our institutional nature is, what makes us us that we need to hold on to in every relationship we're in. If we get sucked too far in the relationship, we lose ourselves. If we overly self-define, we're isolated. And then hopefully at some point you get an ability to hold the narratives of all of these identities you've constructed and realize in a way there are constructions that whoever we are, we, we, we made for ourselves. This could be viewed like a spiritual journey. This could be viewed as an intellectual journey. This could be viewed as a, as a rounds of therapy. But for me, it's this idea that any of these stages may have to be looked at at different stage parts of your life that while you may be 30 40 50 you might be still looking at early childhood middle childhood adolescent issues that just never got resolved and that's why you end up in the therapist's office but it's also the way you then approach your storytelling stuckness and our job as listeners as creating a, a safe environment is to create a space where you can do different kind of stories that are in line with your relative developmental moment and hopefully you're doing it at a point where you're turning from a kind of standpoint of being subject to these complicated narratives of your past to make an object of those narratives in these beautiful little stories and it changes your relationship to that experience such that you can hold it better or the metaphor of it's like a backpack or a suitcase that you carry the weight of your life on. And if you can take one of these experiences that's unprocessed and make sense of it, that, that backpack gets lighter. It's, it's suddenly outside of you and you can use that. And I can assure you a lot of people that come to our workshops, especially since we do a lot of work that's in the trauma space with human rights survivors and survivors of violence of all kinds and, and you know, human rights abuses, et cetera. It's, it's the ability to do this is what makes it possible for flourishing citizenship, for flourishing uh, emotional and economic development. And that each of these levels of stories gives you the opportunity to do this. I'm gonna share a story from the pandemic that's coming out of the workshop I'm teaching right now in Ohio at Kenyon College as an example. And I'm speeding up a li little because I want you to have some time to ask me questions. But this is an example of working through a developmental past related to the, your current moment and what you're dealing with. That dumbass. She said it through gritted teeth. An exasperated sigh escaped her mouth as she jerked the grocery bags wet with snow from the kitchen counter and dropped them dramatically to the floor. She always spoke of my father this way, the man she chose to build a life with. How does this happen? Love turned to contempt. I questioned it even then. Now the counters are all wet. I wanted to speak up for him. For once, it actually wasn't something that he did. For once, maybe I could vindicate him. Sorry, Mom. It was me. I put the bags there. My high-pitched voice squeaked, but still, I was proud of the strength I put behind it. I looked up at her, cheeks still rosy from the lake effect winter winds. I just wanted her to stop being mad at him for once. Surely she could forgive me for some misplaced grocery bags. Well then I guess you're just as stupid as he is. Today, I look down at the tiny infant before me. Skin tacky and cheeks rosy from napping under the early summer sun rays passing through the window. He pauses nursing to flash a big smile at me before rooting for more. I gaze out the window at his father, sanitizing each grocery item and placing it into a sanitized bin before bringing it into the house. A scene from a time where wet grocery bags are hardly a concern compared to what else could be lurking therein. During a global pandemic, you can't be too safe. Would I sanitize each item in the same way? Would I be more thorough? Perhaps, perhaps not. Instead of investing too much in knowing, I just look on with a grateful heart. 
Grateful that I have a partner who does what needs to be done, and respect that the means by which he does it are uniquely his and not any worse or better than what I could have come up with. We're all just guessing here anyway. I breathe a sigh of relief. I may very well be my mother's daughter, but I am also my son's mother. Thanks, babe. You're welcome. The the um, concept that a lot of us um, work who work in in kind of violence prevention focus on is breaking chains, breaking cycles, right? Of of people that get hurt hurt others, and and obviously, if you've done work in those spaces, you know, a lot of times it's by speaking truth to that. That the, the thing happened. It really happened. Uh, our country's in the middle of a, of a, a massive reconsideration of the hurt we've done to classifications of humans in our country and how we can change that. And, and we know it starts with stories being told. And every one of us has a story about um, being forced to comply with an authority that did not ask for our consent. I think at the heart of democracy is consent. Is this what I would choose for myself? And that doesn't mean there shouldn't be a collective discipline or a collective, you know, kind of value system that says we do this together and we would want the society to do it. We want people to, you know, buckle their seatbelts and, and, you know, take care not to harm others. And we don't mean you're being bullied to stop that. But this kind of prompt is something that we invited uh, people across the country, you know, in a program we did called All Together Now, to tell stories just about this as a way into to, to compassion and consideration of each of our individual rights and each of our sense of vulnerability in the face of powers that we don't control. And, and through those stories, I think we can make you know, not just a little change, but a whole lot of change uh, in the world that we live in. So I stop there with my lecture and I go back to all of you. And I think I've done it. I'm, see, I wanna be right down on 715 to now open this up to questions, thoughts. And I can talk about, a, I left a lot of things out, but I hope that was a useful overview, so. Questions, thoughts, I'll, I will look in the chat. If you don't want to expose yourself, you can ask me stuff in the, in the chat. <clears throat> but the microphone is open if you, want to, if you want to ask me something directly. <laughs> Everybody's stunned. I'm looking at Lily in your face and you're like, what just happened? What was that all about? <laughs> yes, um, comment, maybe questions, comment, or Tell your story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. If you, if you, and, and I'd be interested, you know, if people say, well, we've been doing this kind of work in this context, and, you know, we call it this, and how does it relate to what you do? And because there are a lot of these participatory media mechanisms that have been brought into education, you know. Mm. Actually, and again, go ahead. No, I, I'm just thinking about that. Um, because I was teaching a um, technology course and, and actually I just finished reading some assignments. Two of my students actually wrote about storytelling and, and I told those two who cited you also <laughs> saying about this, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether they are here or not, but I mentioned about this uh, talk that you're giving today. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So in, they, they are in secondary schools. So okay. those schools in secondary, uh, I mean, secondary schools in Hong Kong are doing digital storytelling too. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, I, and I've had colleagues working in community contexts in Hong Kong and other contexts in, regionally in China, you know, where this has been picked up for different reasons. Elaine has a question. Yeah. Do these digital stories have to be reflective or can they be informative? Yeah, it's in the public health, that's where I teach. You know, you kind of hear an argument for this is an argument you can buy or not buy is um, there's a data brain and there's a narrative brain. 
and engagement with material. We all need data. We need analytical information. When we think about you know, the, the current public health crisis, we do need to know uh, the statistics, right? We do need to know what the data is, what the research says, et cetera, et cetera. But our engagement is through another part of our you know, kind of way of being. And a lot of the stories that we do in public health, and we work almost in every field of public health. You go to our website, you'll see us working with, you know, uh, all sorts of issues of, of disease. And uh, these stories become useful tools for the information. So you're sort of sandwiching the information around the stories, or the stories are a way in. Here's, here's the, the issue of the public health issue presented as how it's experienced through one individual who's affected by it. And now let's talk about the issues and the data and, and you know, the advice or the, the, the kind of directions to do that. A lot of times, things like public health are about individual choices. Will you do the thing to protect yourself, put on the mask as, as we are all doing? The way you make those, those things stick is to, to have people talk about the reticence or the kind of context that they might be in where it's, they're, they're shamed for putting on a mask in America. Big parts of our country, people are being shamed for practicing, um, you know, social distancing and public health wise activity. Those stories help you to tell that public health process. So I really, you know, take a look at our Silent Speaks project, a lot of international development, public health thing, and see how agencies are using those stories, maybe side by side with one that's more informational. You know, here's here's all the things we want to know in a kind of brochure, like an informational brochure, and this is why it matters. You know. <laughs> Because the data won't get to you. The data won't get to you, but one of these stories will. And you'll go, oh, that's why it matters. Because I can see myself in that person's experience. That's me. And, you know, I, countless examples I could go on. I hope that helped. And, you know, so the point is, yes, of course, you could make an informative story. We'd argue you're not making a digital story, by God. Because we, we're defining it as different from documentary, different from you know, kind of informational videos or public service announcement videos. Those are different communicative genres. And we're sort of digital storytelling. Usually the, the personal part of it is what makes it work. So, <laughs> Elaine, I over explained that. I hope you don't mind. I, I over explained There's another question, Joe, that you missed. Um, oh, yeah. But how do you make a simple or ordinary story moving? Tell the truth. You know, and that sounds easy. But most of us, when we take our first swing at a story, but again, I ask all of you, why did you end up at, uh, at Hong Kong? You, you would say, well, I was doing this before, and, the, you know, and I was really interested, and the opportunity came up, and I took the job. And then I'd say, well, well why? <laughs> so, what do you mean, why? Well, I mean, wh why did you ever do the thing that you were interested in and it got you in Hong Kong? What do you mean, like, why did I study chemistry? Well, yeah, why did you study chemistry? Well, I was just always interested in I was good. I was good in science. I got good grades in that. So why? <laughs> what do you mean, why did I? Well, because I did. No, why? And they'll go, oh, well, because my dad, he always said this was really good. Oh. So tell me about your dad. Now, as soon as I say, tell you about my dad and his relationship to the reason I studied and I cared, Every one of you, or I could have said your mom, every one of you probably has a little part of your heart that goes, yeah, that matters. That's important. That's why I'm here, because I'm serving, you know, the genetic history <laughs> of the Chinese people. Or I'm serving history, and I have this engine of care of people. Mat it mattered what I did with my life, and I'm doing it. I'm at Hong Kong University, a premier university on the planet. And it mattered that I'm here. That's how you make a little story about how you got to Hong Kong <laughs> University. It'd be a story that could be told very simply and we would all listen with our hearts open and our minds open in a way that I think is effective. Right? And relatively elegant and simple if you just kind of trust that telling the truth about that makes us listen. Me. You know. I think of the, the South Korean film Parasite, right? 
won the Academy Award, first time foreign language film, first time in film from Asia, won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Why? Because it told the truth about class in South Korea. It told the truth. It became the most popular film ever to come out of South Korea. And it's, it swept the world, you know. Tell the truth really does make for good storytelling. <laughs> a radically simple idea. Here's a question. At the moment, yeah. Yeah, I, you can tell I calibrated my presentation fully aware of the unique political moment that Hong Kong is. I'm an old Sinophile. That's, that's an unusual thing. I'm an old friend of China. I belong to the U.S.-China Friendship Society in the 1980s. I, in fact, helped coordinate the first exchange between a Chinese university and a U.S. university in 1978 in which the Luvin High, the first ship that came across the ocean from mainland China, from Red China, as we called it, docked in uh, Houston, unloaded its supplies, and I loaded four tons of textbooks that went to um, the university in Shanghai, I'm forgetting, starts with the F, I can't even remember. What is that university that starts with the F? F Fujin? Not Fujin. Some of you know. The point is, I watch what China is going on right now, and I watch it from a perspective of understanding the Chinese um, history and, and the role of the government post Deng Xiaoping and what, you know, from Tiananmen Square forward is meant and what Hong Kong's been trying to do in sustaining the commitment that that country made. Students and everybody there obviously have individual choices about what exposure they have. And the institution has a choice, and all of you as part of it, about what exposure you have. I think we, when we get down to it, you know, the personal stories are, are going to show you the way that you negotiate those, these changes. Each law that changes that limits your speech, you're going to have a way to talking about coexistence and resistance simultaneously. So I think you're, as educators, you, you have a duty, I think, to make space for those different kinds of stories, the ones that are about coexistence and the ones that are about resistance. How you do it, <laughs> good luck. I, I obviously, my heart, is, my heart is with the Chinese uh, people in a general sense, but certainly with the Hong Kong students right now in a big sense. I, I, Patrick knew I, at the end of one of our, you know, things, I started crying because I got so overwhelmed with uh, what's going on there. It's very meaningful to me. And so I, I, I just sort of say, I wish you luck. So it's not easy. It's, this, will be, this will be a complicated thing, but every story matters and giving space for people to talk about what they're going through matters. That was another long answer. It got me all excited with that question. Remember, I studied political science. And, you know, I'm sorry for showing up late. Oh, yeah. The Writers Conference. Search towards home. Creative writing, pedagogy, scholarship. And I call you and are attending today's session because we're in the middle of getting a book proposed with a full publisher. I'm not sure I have a question. That was more like badly. Well, the point is, you're a dear friend of our world. <laughs> My you know, my partner here is a writing program administrator, the co-author of my book, you know. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the world of writing and rhetoric, her explaining to me, you know, things I don't understand. And uh, we have lots and lots of friends in the international kind of writing community, uh, both the sort of um, skill set of writing as in language acquisition writing, as well as, as uh, expressive writing, creative writing, composition, expository writing, persuasive writing. There's a lot of discussions about where story fits in each of these genres of writing, and, and I think it's an interesting space. Do -do -do. Elementary schools. You know, what we've seen elementary teachers do is essentially think of story, to this, this style as the storybook created by the child, 
we had a, something in the United States TV series called Reading Rainbow, in which, you know, the, the wonderful actor from Star Trek, I think, Lamar Burt, Lamar Burt, would read you stories out of storybooks, and, and kids love watching this TV show. So kids can make those things. They can draw the pictures, and they know the picture book form. So in the K3, K4 environment, a lot of digital storytelling has been experimented with that. I'm really interested in that. You may know the Reggio Emiliano preschool and, and kindergarten approach in which young, young students take pictures of their learning process. Like they take pictures of how they learn how to do something and then they put it on the wall. To me, that's also a digital story is that you, you, you get kids to document, like they do a little process together of like planting a plant and they take pictures of the plant through its stages and then they think sit back and say this is what I learned and this is how and this is how I learned it so it leaves some room for like universal design for learning concepts in which every individual has a way of learning the thing that they were supposed to learn it's slightly different so I I like that in the k6 thing is tell the story of how you did the thing you did you know tell the story of how you got it done as a pictorial narrative and then put it into a video and kids will figure that out like that. I mean, you know, three-year-old. <laughs> I'm sure there's three-year-olds editing video somewhere, and then probably <laughs> in Hong Kong. Um, da -da 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 -da. Oh, that was a very nice thing that Ding Gui said. Fudan University, there's the winner. Yeah, I am, thank you very much. I had a beautiful letter from the president of Fudan University in 1978. You can imagine how weird that was back in those days. Uh, I learned about your work starting with experience in English language students through college education for all the secondary school teachers. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I agree with Patrick that maybe the killer app, do we still say that, Patrick? Do we use that expression anymore? Yeah, we we I, can say that, but, but I'm old app. too, Joe, so. <laughs> yeah, we, I don't think we say that anymore. It sounds wrong. But yeah, I think the most critical application of this is as a reflective on an experiential things. In our study abroad world, there's an enormous commitment to digital storytelling. Most of the big study abroad organizations build a kind of journalistic digital storytelling. And we've got beautiful stories from the U.S. Air Force Academy and from various campuses where students go out and they tell the story of what they, what, how they change. This is who I was before that experience. This is who I was afterwards. And that's a critical part of the theory of experiential learning is that the reflection is, is what propels the student's confidence in, in their ability to perform knowledge in the world, to do the thing, to teach the kids English or whatever they're teaching them. Uh, I think it's really the center of where this work can, can go in many education environments. And I think that's why in the social sciences and humanities it will lead, but you, you know, like language ac acquisition or even using it as people that are in service training, you know, certificate training to be a public school teacher, to be a K-12 teacher, having them do reflection through digital storytelling about their, you know, encounters as being in the classroom for the first time or being responsible for that. All of that is being used very actively in the United States, and I think it's a really good mechanism. And um, I'm sure that Patrick's going to have a lot of students making a lot of stories <laughs> as, once they get back on the road and they can go places like like Burma, like Myanmar, and uh, and do the good work that Hong Kong students have been doing. You know, it's really tremendous. Da -da -da. Joe, you've showed some of the prompts. And you've mm -hmm. showed some really amazing products. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhere in between that prompt and that product, uh, something magic is happening. What's the secret sauce? You know, if you go, it, it is, it really the true answer is, you know, I had the simple one, tell the truth. From the storyteller standpoint, you want to tell the good story, tell the truth. Get to the heart of the matter and tell what it's really about. What is it really about? That takes reflection time, so you have to hold that. And, and then the process of making a movie, you know, it really is a kind of particular co-collaborative approach 
that calibrates the individual students' expectations of themselves in the software and their kind of natural design awareness. Maybe they're good in an arty kind of way, or maybe they're not so good in an arty kind of way. It's trying to calibrate the elegance for that product to go out that way. We say, listen deeply, tell stories, because we train our you know, instructors, are the people that learn our facilitative mechanism, in processes of presence and listening as critical to allowing the person to, to commit to the right calibration of what should come through whatever time process you've given them. When we do it right, they feel great about their product as opposed to, oh my God, how did I do that? And, and we know that they've had a kind of nuanced shift in their creative ability. It's, it may not be huge. I mean, again, these four students that we have now, you know, they got a lot of work on their own through this Zoom thing. We're not in the room with them going, hey, how's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Um, but when we are there, that, that listening and getting out of their way, but then sort of leaning in and saying, how's it going? Do you feel good about this part? Keep going forward. That's how we end up with, I think, relatively good projects. And, and, you know, because so much of creativity is letting go. I'm not finished with the script yet. I can't. No, I'm not done. Yes, you are. You're done. It's beautiful. No, let's do the images. Oh, man, I found all these images. Yeah, I know you found a lot, but we just need to use these. Is that okay? It'll look good. If, let me show you. Oh, I want to do these special effects. Oh, no, no. I don't, you know, I don't have time. Keep it simple. <laughs> and that's how, you know, if you see this one I showed from this week, it's, that's all, I mean, almost all stock imagery out of the Wii Video environment, Patrick. That's, that was really cool. And it's not that many cuts. It's maybe eight or nine cuts. Uh, I mean, there are pictures of her baby, which she brought her baby to every class. So it was great because <laughs> she's at home with the baby, you know. Uh, but, you know, it was just smart. And, and of course, she's, she's the Sharon of, of Kenyon. She's really good. Uh, Sharon with us today, the Sharon that you have working with you. I sign you're amazing too, but you know, Sharon's a real, she's a good storyteller. She'll appreciate me. So, you too, Carly, I see you there. I'm not, I'm not leaving anybody out on my team. Carissa, Carly, Sharon, they're all amazing, all amazing. They're my team now, by the way, Patrick. They work for you, but they belong to me. <laughs> I think you've got a question from Olive here. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really pretty full question. Um, you, what we've seen, you know, really it starts with this idea of what, um, when a, it, it didn't work well and what it, when it didn't. What I've seen in classroom environments is the students weren't ready for this particular kind of exercise. And sometimes, you know, um, you have to do other kinds of narrative work story sharing processes before you sort of assign uh, the digital story process in an ESL environment. Yeah, I did a, a year long kind of research project with a community college around their ESL teachers and what worked. And a, a lot of it was that, you know, it was still uh, comfort around um, self, uh, talking about yourself was very low. And part of that was socioeconomic, or, you know, there were other things. But it, 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 I think it's a dance, and, and I don't have a magic bullet for that. I mean, I, I think like anything, this doesn't always work, of course. It's, it, it, you're, you're listening for where your participants are ready to do a kind of reflective writing piece in which part of their story can make it into the foreground. And in a lot of students, in a lot of environments, the issue of safety is is complicated you know even the even a grade makes you feel unsafe much less you don't know these people much less some part of your story 
put you at some risk within the context that you're in. And so, you know, often we, it's like, well, for some populations, that ESL work might be done better in a, in a non-formal or informal learning environment rather than in the formal learning environment. And, and I'm not sure I've seen a cure for those kinds of safety issues. And that may not be what you're talking about, Olive, but that's, that's where, I, in, in the work I've done with ESL folks, that's, it's sort of, people just don't buy in because they're just not feeling like comfortable. <laughs> it's not just with expression, but with like their sense of, of public safety, you know, to talk about what's happened to them or to be invited or they're, or, you know, they're wounded and it's just hard stuff to talk about. I don't know. Yeah, I agree with the, the thing you're saying there, Miranda. You know, I, 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 I blame Descartes, right? At some point, the, the enlightenment thing separated the head from the heart. And ironically, I think we've gone back, you know, all these people doing South Asian spiritual practice or, or Asian Buddhist practice. Or, and a lot of the embodiment part of it is like, well, can we like reintegrate the chakras? Can we, can we remember that we feel everything and that it affects all our thinking? You know, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, George Lakoff from Cal, who's who writes a lot about metaphor. He wrote a book called Metaphors We Live By. And, uh, and he says 98% of what, what we think is emotional, meaning the reason we care to learn this thing is emotional and you know, psychosexual and all these complicated things. And um, I think as educators, we have to understand how much the body is there and how much the story informs the body, informs the, the learner, even as we're acquiring abstract metacognitive you know, abilities to, to research and, and dig, dig deeply into the data set. Um, we still do it in a body that makes choices. And I think we have to understand that, that's kind of abstract. Isn't it time? I, I, I thought I used up my time. What was I, was I supposed to go all the way to eight? I can't remember. I'll, I'll go all night. You know me, Patrick, I'll keep talking. <laughs> Well, we, we have it until 11. That's what we said about the time for this session. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, I didn't, I didn't lecture. I, I always like responding to questions and, and feeling like I'm talking to an audience where I'm addressing something they care about, you know. Um, and, I, you know, Miranda, I, I took your, com your statement as much as a statement as a question, so I appreciate it. Anything else? Anything else? <laughs> I could show more stories. Would that be crazy? Would people like to see stories. <laughs> I don't know. Can I ask a question? Could I ask a question? Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure, please. Hi, yeah, I'm Kira. I'm from Poly U and mm -hmm. here in Hong Kong. And um, I was wondering uh, when you talked about safety, that's, that, mm -hmm. that's uh, something I've been thinking about, like how students can feel safe telling their story here in mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And how, um, when I was listening to you, I was thinking that storytelling and democracy seem to go together in some way. How mm -hmm. telling the truth, like you said, mm -hmm. um, and how it's all emotional. And sometimes our students might be a little bit concerned about telling the truth because they might end up in jail. <laughs> so I was mm -hmm. wondering, um, how could we structure it or how could we make it so that um, they might feel safe um, or that we don't um, they don't end up in jail or like how can we do it in this very cultural uh, like this very politically sensitive time I mean, that we're experiencing here yeah. right. you know what comes up for me is that for the last four years i've been working with public libraries and i'm a i, I you know i'm from berkeley i have a very strong political opinion and it reflects yeah. the culture i live in and all that mm -hmm. but what i loved about libraries and i think this is true of universities is the neutrality i mean it was true of churches historically is 
in every culture, there has to be a neutral safe space for the culture to work at all. There has to be a neutral safe space. Over time, if you remove that, then you create neuroci and those neuroci are themselves a kind of viral um, condition that will destroy the society eventually. Uh, again, I'm living in the United States right now where the virus of racism, which got to be run amok for a few years <laughs> at a new level, made a lot of people not feel safe. Well, the reaction they had wasn't to, to bury their heads in the sand, it's, it's to rise up, you know, and once in a while, that's what people do. They'll rise up because you're trying to shut down that narrative. You're saying, I can't talk about the way racism has affected me. Well, hell yeah, I can. And, and so I do think the neutral spaces, al allowing for difference of opinion is a fundamental part of what educational experiences are. Obviously, we live in a world where, and I'm not gonna even use the, the accusation of autocratic governments, but in which ideological perspectives tend to wash over things. Well, they can come from every direction, right? They don't have to come from something that's historically associated with, you know, the left or the right or whatever. Uh, hopefully universities are spaces where intellectual freedom is <laughs> encouraged. And in oh, well, I'm, I'm coming from opinions. like PolyU, where we had a mm -hmm. siege of the university. So yes. we, it's no longer, it's quite clear that uh, universities uh, here in Hong Kong may not seem, may not be the most neutral. Um, so, and uh, like it used to be churches in Eastern Europe, right? But yeah. um, even universities. So are you thinking, I'm thinking maybe a neutral space could be the internet, although that can also be um, uh, censored. Yeah, but I mean, look at it this way. is like, one of the things that I, I, even though I come from an ideological place, historically, maybe, I sort of believe every story matters. So that means every story matters. That means if I disagree with you, your story still matters, right? Your story, who you are as a human and how you ended up thinking the thing you think matters. So somewhat is us doing that sort of negotiative, diplomatic, cultural process through story to build bridges between difference. Because opinion is this, right? Opinion is a wall that's as usually impermeable in all our cultures right now. We have a lot of that partisanship and, and sort of <laughs> escape velocity, um, uh, you know, separation of, of thinking from one group to another. But story is what comes back across. And I, I worked in like the abortion space in the United States with story, something called um, pro-choice. I mean, a pro, what do they call it? Pro-voice, right? They change the language. So, and, and we use all these story circles to, to have people of differing opinions around the abortion issue and very hot issue in the United States to kind of be in the same room for a while. You know, I did it with environmentalists and, and lumber industry people. Story is a good place for appreciative inquiry to happen. We have to have environments where that's possible. I would certainly hope our, you know, our cultural institutions, you know, both the museum, library, you know, universities, and, and other kinds of social, are places where appreciative inquiry and narrative intervention, listening and story sharing can happen. Uh, is it? Yeah, a little bit. Internet, internet, you know, social media is a, is a comparison media. And as somebody I heard, it's an itching salt for the ego. It's not really a healthy place to be uh, because we're seeing each other amplify our, our annoyances rather than our um, tolerance. And, and so, I, you know, I don't, I don't, the internet's great in that all the opinions will blossom as Mao the hundred schools of thought contend, but, um, but it doesn't necessarily turn out that well. Uh, and it's easily manipulated, right? All the, all the autocrats are learning how to manipulate our opinions by feeding us the noise of our, our itching salt, our irritant. That makes me mad when I see that. Um, that's not our, that's not our, our work is to undo all that. It's undo all that, that sort of hyper-partisanship. Did that help? <laughs> and I appreciate your work. And I, <laughs> again, 
you read the headlines over here. I'm, I'm sure like you're reading the headlines in the United States. So what the hell is going on over there? And I'm reading the headlines from Hong Kong. What the hell is going on over there? But all of you on the ground are doing the good work. So keep doing the good work. And, and we'll all get through this and we'll still be supporting each other. And I plan to do more work in China in the next 10 years, you know, uh, almost to make this uh, <laughs> a, uh, what do they call it? You know, an antibody for democracy. This thinking is, is, a, is a way that may sneak in underneath the, the radar. And the teaching tolerance through narrative sharing is, is something that will make people feel better about democracy, not, not worried about it. So. There are two other questions there. Yes, I know. I'm seeing it. Can you tell us more about it? You developed a cookbook and the story of its successful development. Well, again, I, I was a, trained in theater and so I could write into how, how you make good stories from the narrative theorists that I got trained in. So I had a little bit of an advantage when I started writing about story making to kind of have that perspective. I ran a theater for 10 years. I worked for with a lot of amazing American artists and other artists. So that's why the cookbook kind of had a jump on this kind of stuff. So that's one part. I knew the story and I could talk about it. And I was a community artist, so I could also talk about it in a way that invited people in. The people I was around, you know, were the other kinds of people that were looking at a student-centered, you know, educational process. So it aligned with a lot of that. That's why I think it was successful. Um, discuss how they come to stand a complex concept. You know, that's a really, there's a project that I would like to do. I have, I have some colleagues who work in neuroscience who are looking at how you might um, use digital storytelling in the, in sort of looking at layers of understanding of neuroscientific information. Uh, there's been a lot of cognitive science like Roger Shank, who was a, um, an AI guy from the 90s who, who worked in story that, that think that this is a sort of critical thing. Gregory Bateson back in the 50s said, you know, we'll know that story, that computers are really smart when you ask them a question and they say, that reminds me of the story. Um, I think we're learning that you can, you can hold complexity in narratives because of the way ambiguity works. And I think there's stuff in that. I think it's all going to be in this sort of neuroscience, cognitive science area where we'll have people using story and, and the unpacking of, of a narrative thing, an object, in really interesting and complex ways. Again, I'm, that's not my job, but I'm, I read into that literature and I, I'm fascinated with all of that. Examples of stories would be good, yeah, okay. Let me think, what do I have that's, I have one, let me see if I can find it. Ohio State University Physics, Ohio State University Digital Story Physics. I should get so lucky. There is a search. Whoa. The disease encased in wax. Here's a good place to go. So I'm gonna put this into, this is the OSU's digital storytelling site. I'll put this into the chat because I may not be able to find the exact one that I'm looking for, but OSU's library, academic library system picked up digital storytelling. A couple of librarians wrote a book about digital storytelling in the academic library several years back. And then, then it became part of a lot of different departments. So when I was there, you know, <laughs> There, yeah, I mean, it's not a terribly complex concept, but a, a, a biology teacher uh, taught cell di division, and she used the entire marching band of Ohio State, like they go out on the football field, and she had them, as part of the digital story, demonstrate cell division, <laughs> marching through the, you know, it was the most amazing thing I ever saw. But the one I'm thinking about is, is somebody talks about the, from a physics about light 
and one of what I would consider the threshold concepts of uh, physics, you know, um, the nature of light. And, the, and he used a digital story as a way into it, but it was more like him talking about, and I, I've done a lot of science storytelling. Uh, it was more his process of discovery. It was like the detectives, it's like a lot of popular writing about science. It's sort of the detective narrative of a research process. But look there, I'm sure there's something there. So he's doing something connected VR and storytelling, says Adam Forster. Yeah, there's a, a center out of Boston uh, called the Public VR Lab. Public VR Lab. Um, you can search. I will put that down. And and we and them have been trying to, I, I call my workshop uh, DST in the round because we, we were mainly just teaching using immersive cameras to do something similar to what we did. But we were thinking about what, you know, why would you do that? Um, uh, I don't feel like we've gotten that far because in some ways to do interesting interactive work in VR, you, you know, you've got to wrap your head around Unity or other kinds of, of uh, authoring systems. And, and that's sort of like a lot of this kind of work once it goes like, like more advanced filmmaking. It's like, nah, you gotta, you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta have a crew that does it. It's not a do it yourself thing. Um, but yeah, the, the workshop, the, the, the experiences I had out of the two, three workshops, three workshops I've done, they weren't conclusive to me. In other words, I didn't go, ooh, I can see exactly why this would be important. But I feel like I was just touching, scratching the surface. Uh, I have a great picture on Facebook of a, a workshop where everybody at the end has goggles on. They were doing the screening, right? But everybody's looking on. And, and it's great. It's a great way to... It's a great way to experience film in some ways. It's, it, you can stand up and look around in the world you're in. Public VR lab. There might be um, another question or so, but we okay. got a short questionnaire. So I'm just going to show it on the screen here, but mm -hmm. uh, people can keep on asking questions. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Justine, can you also put the link in the chat box, please? Mm -hmm. Yes. Please let everybody know whether this was useful or not. I appreciate the time, obviously. Mm -hmm. And Joe, as, as we get near to the end, I just mm -hmm. wanted to kind of let people know that, you know, this is a one-off talk, but mm -hmm. we've been working in this direction of kind of forming a community of practice for some months now. I'm, I'm really pleased to see so many people from other institutions coming along today. And I don't see this talk as a kind of standalone one-off. We are looking to kind of build a larger community of practice across our institutions in Hong Kong. And as I've talked about a couple of times, you know, we're, we're targeting 2022 for that digital storytelling conference. Um, and, and we are, we've got a lot of different projects that we're, we're brewing up. And I know that PolyU has projects and I know that HKUST has things going on in this area. So I really hope that you know, for those people who've come along today and thought, well, that's really interesting, you know, how can I apply it? Um, or, you know, I've got an idea about how to apply it. I hope that we can use this opportunity to kind of just get the word out that this is an area that we are looking at developing collaboratively. So if people want to kind of reach out after the uh, presentation, I'll put my email address in the uh, chat box. And, and if people do feel like it'd be great to spend a little bit of time talking to Joe about an individual project that you might be working on. We do have a little bit of, of time still um, in the grant and we can, we can potentially arrange uh, for Joe to, to have a Zoom session with individuals. Um, so, you know, by all means, I hope that people are thinking about where can I go from here and how can we pull together 
as a community to kind of bring things forward? Because we, we do have quite a lot going on in this area. I'm happy to do all of it. Just let me know. Let me get through this week. Yeah. <laughs> if I survive this week. <laughs> Jesus. You and me both. <laughs> Crazy. I, I don't have the chat window open anymore. I don't know if we got anything else. It's okay. There's, there's no questions going on there. Okay. And, and we're, at, we're at 1057. And I know that you're probably getting ready for dinner, Joe. I love the idea of dinner. Dinner's a wonderful thing. It should happen. Uh, but I, again, thank thank you to Lillian and and to CAS and Patrick and and uh, to our sponsor Sarah at the consulate and and thanks to all of you for showing up to hear this old Texan rag on about all this stuff. I, I really I know sometimes it makes very little sense what I talk about uh, in any context, but but I think you guys um, I'm glad I could hold your attention for a little bit here. I'd also like to remind people that Joe did an interview with uh, the Teachers Lift podcast, uh, which is a professional development podcast that we're working on uh, at Hong Kong U together with Polly U and HKUST. So if you are interested in hearing a little bit of a more informal chat that uh, my colleagues here at Hong Kong U had with, uh, with Joe earlier in the week, by all means, I've just put in the, uh, the hyperlink to teacherslift.com. So you can, you can go there, you can hear a, a less kind of uh, less structured discussion that Joe had uh, earlier in the week. And uh, again, a, a really, a really nice discussion. Um, and, and Joe, I, I really want to thank you for the impact that you're having on so many teachers here in Hong Kong. It's been really my privilege to kind of sit in on your workshops when I've had the opportunity to sit in on those workshops. And it's been my privilege to be able to be here along for the ride as I've seen the impact that you've had on colleagues here in Hong Kong U, as well as Hong Kong. So I, I really, really appreciate all the time that you've given us, Joe. Um, today in the talk, as well as in the, the kind of months and weeks leading up to this. Yeah, no, right on. It's a great and collaboration, in, in story It's center, the beginning of a long story together, Patrick. In, in, in story center or in story circle fashion, I'm going to give Joe, give Joe the, this applause. So anybody who's been through the digital storytelling workshop will know this is how we applaud as other people are speaking. So thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great, great rest of your day there. Yeah. Be safe. Thanks, Joe. Enjoy your dinner. Keep, keep, Thank keep you. telling stories. Thank All right. You tomorrow. See you guys. Hong Kong colleagues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See you in future sessions. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Lillian. Thank you. Right on.